All right, welcome back to the One Bar and Lupagus Show. I am Lupagus here with a very special guest. We have Ryan Roberts. Go give him a follow at Rise and Draft on Twitter. Draft guru, draft expert. Not sure what is the title, but I think they all fit. Yeah, well, I'll let everybody else decide what they want to call me, I guess. But I appreciate you for having me on, man. This, I mean, we're just talking beforehand. This is my favorite time of the year. You know, like my my favorite week is actually Combine Week, but the couple mm-hmm. weeks leading up into the draft when everyone is just trying to decipher every top 30 visit and who likes who and who doesn't like who and who's trading up who's trading down this is the best time of the year honestly yeah i agree with you 100 percent on that so tell us before we get into the vikings in the draft tell us a little bit about your background where do you come from uh how you got into the draft and where our viewers can can follow you yeah i mean it's it's uh it's been a very organic jersey um journey i guess i kind of owe it all to my dad i guess you know kind of early on Everyone has like their first memories of, you know, playing sports and playing football and all that type of stuff. I literally can't remember a time where I didn't love football, you know, like it was kind of like a seven, eight year old type of thing, you know, like as far back as I can remember, football has just been kind of my thing. And my dad is a draft Nick, I guess, in his own right. Right. Like he grew up and he had the the draft magazines and he was printing off mock drafts from like Walter football before yes. we knew that Walter football was a trash site. You know what I mean? And just like d- d- scouting our own play. Okay, hey, we have Walter on sometimes. So don't you be saying, oh, trash okay. I'm site. sorry. I'm sorry. No <laughs> shots on Walter then. But we used to print out, print out a bunch of mock drafts, do our self scouting, kind of compare it to what people were saying. We used to print out like the ESPN mocks from Mel Kuyper and do all that type of stuff. So we're kind of cross checking a little yeah. bit, you know, when I'm like nine or 10 years old. And I, I just always kind of felt like I, kind of gravitated towards that because it's such a fascinating landscape, man. It really is. I mean, there's so many parts of a scouting department. I mean, you talk about the area scouts and the scouting directors and the pro scouting departments and everything in between. Like it's a very fascinating process and always has been for me. So I played high school, played briefly in college, messed up my shoulders, double labrums, you know, and I was kind of just trying to figure out how to stay close to the game. So I actually went into coaching for a little bit there and on the side, I'm, freelancing and writing for different sites and luckily I, I think i'm pretty good at it right so like it's opened a few doors and i now scout for like the college Gridiron showcase i i work for rpm data which is a consulting side of the business so we work directly with like sports agents to you know or football agents to you know for potential targets and guys that fit their criteria and that type of stuff i've written for USA Today and Sports Illustrated and a, a bunch of different stuff. So on the mm-hmm. media side, I've been in the in the light, I guess, at Rise and Draft for a little bit now. But you know, on the other side, it's consulting, it's podcasting, first team NFL draft and po- college football podcast that I do with Jody Leon, who I know you said has been on this channel before. So uh, kind of touching all the markets, you know, and really kind of highlighting the draft because, I mean, people throw a lot of shade at Mel Kiper on Twitter and stuff, but like. He's the godfather, man. Like, yep. we would not be here right now if it was not for Mel Kuyper, right? So, I, yeah. I love this time of year. I love this type of coverage. This is my bread and butter, and it's something that I've loved for a very long time. And I love what you and Joe, when you guys do your, your rankings of positions, like, you guys don't follow the herd. Like, I mean, you guys truly have your own opinions, and, and they're different. I'll be listening to I ride the bike. I'm like, what the hell you got that guy ranked there? And I appreciate that. Like, I mean, it's a yep. different take on a lot of these players, and it's an honest take. Because you always talk about going back to the summer scouting. So, you must start. How does that work? You start 2024, like the summer, I mean, the summer yeah. 2023, that's when you really get into it. I mean, for some context, because, you know, for RPM data that we do consulting, we're trying to scout, we're trying to scout classes from like a, a year or two out. I mean, we're really trying to get a little bit like super ahead of the curve. So, but for just for like the general, like, let's use 2025 NFL draft next year's class for a little bit of, you know, comparison. I started scouting 2025 about a week and a half ago. So I'm already starting in like, so when we get to summer scouting in like a month or two or whatever the heck we start that process, that's work that I've been doing, you know, for a couple months or several weeks at that point. Right. So mm-hmm. it's an, it, it, it is a, it's a very unique process because I feel like if you are a, a, a guy that really tries to do it right or tries to do it as thoroughly as possible, it kind of never ends. I mean, it really doesn't like it just extends into the next cycle. So a lot of people get burnt out because I mean, it's just, it's, con- it's consistent work from a year round perspective, but for people that love it, I, I know Joe loves it. I know I love it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of other people that kind of mainstream in this or, you know, kind of stick in this process, they, they love it as well also. So, you know, I've already started 2025. I'll be having a lot of takes throughout and I, I guarantee, and this is a promise that, you know, the, Day after the draft, there will be an early 2025 players to watch for me that's going to be nice. out in the Twitterverse somewhere. So, yeah. yeah, the work never stops, man. 
Absolutely. All right, let's talk some Minnesota Vikings in the draft. And I'm sure you're sick as hell. I mean, we're sitting here April 9th. You've been talking about these quarterbacks, I, I suppose, at ad nauseum since January. But I want to I phrase it to you this way. If you're the Minnesota Vikings, what do you do? Do you, do you package together this godfather deal to go in the top three? I'm yeah. not going to say Drake May, but probably Drake May. Mm-hmm. Or do you trade? And now it's saying that the, the Cardinals want three first-round picks. Do you do that to get the four to maybe get J.J. McCarthy? Or do you just mm-hmm. stay back and, and and take like a Michael Penix and keep your picks? What route would you do if you're the Vikings? I mean, I feel like the I feel like the Vikings can't sit back and settle. I mean, I, I don't think obviously you got the extra first round pick, number twenty three overall, to just sit back and just kind of let the board fall. I, I I think that that's I think that that's the incorrect process. A lot, you know. There's some teams like the Baltimore Ravens are an instance, right, where they just kind of let guys fall to them, and they usually just take the best player available, and that's how they've been programmed since Ozzie Smith, and now what mm-hmm. Eric DeCosta is doing, right? And that is a winning formula, but. I do think Minnesota is in a unique situation where I like a lot of the roster, you know, like they have a couple of really good weapons. They have some pieces on defense that you can build around and that you can continue to get a lot out of. Right. And and you have a, who I can, I consider a, a very good young coach in Kevin mm-hmm. O'Connell. Right. So like you have a lot of pieces that say trajectory is moving forward, but obviously you're missing the one important cog and that is the quarterback. Right. And although I think that if you stuck at 23, let's say, and, Maybe a Michael Penix or a Bo Nix are there out of Oregon. Could they potentially be good players on the NFL level? Yeah, in the right situation. And I always honestly think that the Minnesota Vikings are about as quarterback friendly of a situation of any team that needs a quarterback this year. I mean, most teams are, I mean, like New England, if they draft a quarterback this year, it's not a great situation to be in for the next couple of years, man, because they are they are just desperate for talent offensively. Like it is not going to be pretty often for whoever. New England takes if they decide to take a quarterback this year. So I think Minnesota's in a good spot. And I think that Minnesota obviously gets that ammo because they want to go get their guy, right? Like, so I don't think sitting back is the right formula, what, whether it is. And obviously the conversation starts with New England at three because New England, and I, I've kind of put this out in the universe a little bit. I, I had a very good conversation with a pretty good source when I was in Indianapolis that New England's not desperate to take a quarterback at three. They are a potential mover in this class because they understand, and I think that Jared Mayo understands that the defensive roster is pretty dang good in, in New England, like it has been for the last 20 years or whatever. But the offense needs a lot of retooling, man. Like this is not a quarterback fix away from New England being a good offensive football team. Like there's some retooling that needs to happen. So I think that they will be in the potential trade back market. So you tr- you talk to New England. Obviously, you mentioned, you know, the Arizona Cardinals at four, what their asking price would be. And then the Los Angeles Chargers at number five are a team that's still potentially a trade back option. So I would start at three. I would. Mm-hmm. And if Drake makes your guy, you invest to go up and get you get, get your guy. I am a big fan of taking big swings on quarterbacks because although there's going to be misses from time to time, it works out a lot more favorably, in my opinion, than settling on a guy that maybe is good. But the floor, the ceiling might be a little bit lower, which is what you're going to be t- picking if you decide to take one at 11 or 23. So if I was Minnesota, I would be ultra aggressive and I wouldn't be, you know, overly aggressive in the sense of like mortgaging everything. But if there is a price that is attainable and that makes sense, I would be willing to trade up to make it happen if Drake May is your guy. And honestly, I, and we'll talk about J.J. McCarthy. I'm not the biggest J.J. fan of all time, but like if Minnesota deems him as their guy. You'd still be aggressive because at the end of the day, I think you need to find your guy in this draft, not settle for a guy that you like. Go for a guy that you think is great. I agree. Get him, get your make the choice. Don't let our team choose for you. Make the choice. Exactly. That's kind of what I've been going with. Yep. Uh, let's talk about a certain prospect here. I know you're not as high on him as, as we are here in Minnesota, but Tavondre Sweat, the big, yep. meaty defensive tackle from Texas. Uh, he's what we need. We need a big nose who can eat up space, can also create some interior pressure. He just got into some trouble with the recent yep. DUI. How far does this send him down the draft board and where do you see him potentially coming off the board now? So if this was a one-off situation where there was nothing prior and this was just a situation of someone making a bad decision and just having to explain that, I don't think it's a big deal. But as Dane Brugler had put out there and is kind of pu- is public information now is that there have been questions about previously about Tavondre Sweat and underage drinking and partying and and that type of stuff, right? So there is a little bit of a recurring issue here, which he'll have to answer to. And it sounds like he has been very upfront before this incident about that. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to call it demons. Cause like I drank underage too, right? Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to say necessarily demons, but like about your past 
things that would be deemed as a red flag, right? To, to be able to be upfront about that. But I do think that when you are upfront about it, the next step is to prove that you are true in your words and that you are moving forward with progress, right? So obviously this is a little bit of a derailment. This is a step back. I honestly, like, I personally just wasn't buying the first round hype of Tavondre Sweat. I just wasn't buying it. I thought, he, I, I still believe that he was going to be an early day two football player. So somewhere in the second round. Does this knock him back a half a round or a round? It's possible. So we might be talking about more of a late second rounder or a early third rounder. But, I mean, either way, I don't think it's going to be such a drastic fall. Like, this isn't like a, wow, we're getting Devondre Sweat staring at us in, four, in the fourth or fifth round. Like, I, I don't buy that. I don't think it's going to be that much of a dip. I think it might drop him down a little bit. But overall, I don't think it's going to be anything like debilitating to his money situation or to his round projection. Oh shit, Ryan! You're supposed to tell me he's gonna get the 108. So thank you for. Uh... <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I don't think that's gonna happen, man. I don't. I I'm actually that. That's one position that I've been a little bit like. I've been a little bit back and forth with some people on, and, and just in general, good conversation with some friends that I really respect in the business. I'm not as big on the interior defensive line class as some people are, man. Like some mm. people are like, "This is a great class. It's super deep." I'm like it's it's good i mean it's 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 not bad it's a it's a pretty good class so i actually like Devondre sweat in this class because i mm. don't think it's a great overall interior defensive line class but i don't think he drops to 108 because he has look first and foremost he has a high floor because you just you don't make a lot of guys that look like him right like 360 mm -hmm. pounds and the run stopper and he brings a high floor to the table as a run defender i do have questions about the overall pass rush upside and, and guy that consistently play on third downs but regardless, I don't, I, I don't envision him lasting the 108. So I'm sorry to burst the bubble there, but yeah, I, I you think did. he's still a day two football player. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Again, we're here with Ryan Roberts at Ryzen Draft. Give him a follow on Twitter, Draft Guru, Draft Expert, the next Mel Kuyper Jr. Uh, let's talk about 108 because the Vikings weird situation this year. We have two first round picks, probably only gonna have one. So we could potentially be picking at you know top five and then waiting all the way. Mm -hmm. Until the start of day three. So Vikings have big needs on that interior defensive line. Hell, even let's just say D-line overall, because he was a five tech. We need a nose. What are some prospects there? Who are some guys who could be there for the Vikings at that position? I mean, one of my favorite players in the draft, and if we're talking about just kind of butt kickers in the run game, similar to what Devontae Sweat, I mean, a completely different body type, but I love Dwayne Carter out of Duke. Mm -hmm. I really do. I, I think that he is one of the more underappreciated underappreciated players in the draft because I actually think D Duke used him very, I think they use him a little bit incorrectly this year for Duke. Cause I mean, there were times, I mean, you mentioned five tech, they're playing him at six, two plus 305, 310 pounds at zero at three, all the way out to five. Like at times, I mean, if you watch the Notre Dame game, for instance, like they were just, they just said, Notre Dame, you're not going to run the football on us today. So we're putting him in a four down look as a five tech. And we're just like, uh, like that's cool and all. And it worked mm -hmm. for them, but, strategically like it doesn't make a lot of sense for him on the next le level right logistically that's not gonna be a role that he plays but man that kid is super powerful mm -hmm. incredible pop in his hands really stout and, and lowly built to the grounds he can create a ton of power in tight spaces he really can and i do think that he has a little bit of more pass rush upside than maybe some people give him credit for because he's a player that i think honestly was asked to do a lot at Duke. And from a two-gap perspective, from holding a point of the tag perspective, if you let the shackles loose a little bit on him at times, I think that he could be an even more productive pass rusher than he was at Duke. And he was pretty productive at times at Duke as a pass rusher. So Dwayne Carter at 108, I think, would be a really tremendous value. And if we're just looking for a pure pass rusher, a guy that could eventually grow into maybe a five-tech down the line, a little bit more of a lightly built guy right now, but I love Jalik's hunt out of Houston Christian. Mm. I've been talking about him a ton on Twitter recently. He is right now about 6'4 and 6'8, or actually, I'm sorry, 6'3 and 6'8, 250 pounds. And or actually, I think he weighed at 254 at the combine. And he still looks skinny. Like this kid could legitimately be 265 plus pounds. A former Cornell walk on safety started his career at Cornell. And then he transfers to Houston Christian and he just balloons, man. Like puts on great weight, goes to the combine, runs 464. Three, uh, 37 and a half inch vert, 10 plus, broad, I think like a 10, eight broad jump. Like this kid's a freak of nature. Now you're going to have to be a little bit patient with him because he's only been playing defensive end for two years. And even the last two years at Houston Christian, he was playing more of a stand up rusher role where he's dropping in coverage a ton. So like his pass rush repertoire is very raw, but man, the cornering ability, the flexibility, the explosiveness, 
that stuff's all there, man. So sky's the limit for a guy like Jaleek's Hunt out of Houston Christian. But if we're going interior defensive line, Dwayne Carter is definitely my guy out of Duke in that range. Nice. I think the Vikings have actually met with him. So yeah. I love everything you're saying about Dwayne Carter. Uh, let's same question, different position. Let's go interior O-line center guard. Vikings could use some help there. I mean, right now our starting left guard is Blake Brandell, which is horrifying. We have no depth. So uh, who are some options there? Yeah, I mean, it's actually a, a very deep offensive line class, and it's mostly because the offensive tackle class is probably one of the better ones we've had over the last couple of years, and I think that's kind of spilled over to quality depth inside, especially at center. So I actually think there's a couple really intriguing options here, you know, if I could ramble for a second, but mm -hmm. uh, um, Kyron Abengaji, who is an – he played offensive tackle at Yale, and I believe that he could still play offensive tackle, but my guy is incredibly dense and powerful. I mean, he is six foot five plus. He's 320 plus pounds. He could easily play inside a guard if that is what you see of him early. But then he also has the length and athleticism, the short area quickness to play tackle in a, in a pinch in a long term. So I think he brings a little bit of position flexibility. If he wasn't coming off of the he had a quad injury that cost him the, la, the most of the season this past year in 2023. If he wasn't hurt, I think he's probably a slam dunk top 100 player. But I think the fact that he is still coming off that injury, I mean, he just had his pro day the other day and he still wasn't able to test in any capacity. He was able to do some of the position drills, which is great to see. But I think just that injury and just coming off of it and everything, I think that's going to hurt his stock a little bit. So at 108, as long as the medicals kind of check out for each team by team perspective, I think Karan Abengaji is a really talented player out of Yale. If you want just more of a true in, a couple of interior guys, Christian Mahogany out of Boston College is a kid that was being talked about two years ago as a potential like top 50 pick and – he, he obviously got hurt before the 2022 season, came back in 2023, and I thought he was good. You know, like he had a good season. I think he's still – it's taking off some bad weight on his frame. Like he showed up to the combine. I thought he looked a lot healthier, a lot better, just kind of good weight on that frame compared to what I thought he saw had in 2022. But he's kind of a plug-and-play guy. Like I don't think his upside is massive, but if you just want a physically imposing guard on the interior, he had a dominant week at the East West Shrine Bowl. I, I think that he just brings a lot of uh, floor to the table of a guy like a Christian Mahogany. And the last guy who's kind of a center guard flex is Bo Limmer out of Arkansas, who I prefer at center, but he has experience playing a guard at Arkansas as well. He's right around, he's over six foot four. I think he's right around six foot five, 300 plus pounds. Again, just kind of hits thresholds that you want, right? Like he's physical. He's He's got a pretty good power profile. He's a good functional athlete for the position as well. That versatility, I think, at pick 108 would be really appealing because I think he could play guard for the short term, but then long term, depending on how what your center situation is, I think he could potentially fit in there long term as well. Yeah, it's not good. He could play center next year when Bradbury leaves. We'll all uh, not shed a tear when he goes. Um, <laughs> let's just talk more about day three. Vikings have quite a few picks on day three. It's a snooze fest on day two, but day three they'll be active. Uh, and you kind of already touched on this. You mentioned interior line, but another position yeah. class, and maybe it's really deep that they could find some value at there on day three. Oh, man, I, I think corner and wide receiver. And I, I I think the Vikings have a need for a wide receiver three, if I remember from a conversation yep. I had recently with someone. And corner, I feel like, has been a need for them for a while. <laughs> it feels like. It like, always like, is. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, some guys, like, like I liked Andrew Booth a couple years ago. I know yeah. he has not played well for Minnesota so far. Hopefully he takes a year three jump. I don't know if yep. that's in the cards. Potentially, he showed a little but, bit last year late, so maybe. Yeah, Hopefully. I, I'm hoping because, I mean, the talent was very good. It was just all about just kind of the rawness from technique for him coming out of Clemson. But cornerback, I think, is a big one. I mean, there's going to be some guys that – are kind of sliding in the corner class because I think that's one of the one or I think that's one of the most underappreciated classes this year is because I mean you have day two into day three guys like TJ Tampa out of Iowa State, Cam Hart out of Notre Dame, Kalen King has been a, a, a massive faller in this class as well. Like I can't really get a gauge on where he's going. I mean he can go anywhere between the second and fourth round and I wouldn't be totally shocked. A guy that was once projected as a first round pick out of Penn State. So corner I think is a big one that you can find a lot of talent. Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest is another one. And wide receiver, I mean, four out of the last five years, I feel like we've had historical wide receiver classes. Like last year's wasn't the best that we've had over the last couple of years, but we're back this year. I mean, that group is incredibly deep. If you need a wide receiver, whether it's a smaller, shiftier slot type, you know, maybe a Malik Washington out of yes. Virginia, for instance, or a taller, more boundary-esque wide receiver. I feel like those guys are kind of littered throughout this draft. So wide receiver corner, I think, present kind of the biggest values on day three because it's just a good volume this year at each position. Nice. All right. Uh, love love hearing you say Malik Washington, one of my favorite players yes. on <laughs> the player, area. area. Yeah, he is. Good I like player. him. Uh, other than J.J. McCarthy, because uh, who, who do you think is like the most overhyped prospect this year? I, I, 
I think that we have overhyped a couple linebackers this year just because I don't think it's a great linebacker class. The one guy that I like, but I'm seeing in like late first round conversation or linebacker one conversation that I just don't, I just can't get there with is Edrin Cooper out of Texas A&M. I like Edrin. I really do. He is a very explosive athlete. He's got incredible length. I mean, I think he had 34 inch arms at the combine. Like he's a physically impressive kid. And there are moments this year for Texas A&M in 2023 where you're like, yep, that kid could be a difference maker if developed properly. I just think he's a guesser right now. Like I just, I think the game is still moving a little bit fast for him. I don't think it's quite slowed down. And, and that could be the difference between, uh, uh, that could be the difference between a guy like a Devin white and a guy like a Jared Davis, you know, like sometimes the game doesn't slow down for some guys, you know, and, and for like a Jared Davis, when he came out of Florida, he had all those same tools, you know, like you looked at him, you're like, that guy looks great. There's moments of flashes, but then he gets to Detroit and the game just never slows down. And his eyes just kind of always seem to be in the wrong place. I think that Edrin Cooper, if drafted in the right spot in more like a top 75 range, I'm good with, because there's mm-hmm. developmental upside there. But if we're talking about him as a top 32 player or even just a top 45, 50 player, I think we're reaching a little bit in that situation. So I'll go with Edwin Cooper just because I think that the road to him being a quality or plus starter on the NFL is a couple years down the line. I do not see an immediate return as much as people are acting like there is. And I got to tell you, though, watching him, he was one of the few players this year. I'm watching his highlights and his film. I'm like, holy shit, he's just destroying yeah. dudes out there. It was fun to watch. He's explosive, man. He's really, I mean, again, if you watch, if you, if I showed you Edron Cooper's top 10 plays of the 2023 season, you would say that he's probably a top 20 player in this class. And I wouldn't argue with you. Incredible uh, highlights. But then if I show you the top 20, 25 lowlights, you'd be like, "Mm, that's not great, man. Like, it's just the consistency that needs to be found with an Edron Cooper. If he hits, though. Yeah. He's potential to be a plus starter in the NFL. It's just I think that that roads a couple years from now, not quite in year in the year twenty twenty four. All right, let's do the flip side of that. Who is somebody flying under the radar right now? People, maybe a prospect uh, who's getting slept on a little bit. Well, I, I think I mentioned one earlier, but I think Kalen King went from he went from a very good prospect to a guy that's going to be a faller to a guy that I think is just unnecessarily falling. I, I, I would still take Kalen King in the second round. Like I would still do that. Right. He's not the first round player that mm-hmm. I thought he could be in the summer because his 2023 film was not nearly as good as the 2022 film. And there might be a reality with his lack of length that he might be a slot on the next level. Like he might just not be a full-time outside guy, but I still see short air explosiveness, even though he doesn't have great long speed. I still see great tackling ability. I see proactiveness. I see physicality. I still think he could be a plus starting quarter in the NFL, whether that's on a nickel or a zone based outside scheme. Like I still think that he can do those things. But then the other guy I want to mention who I would not be shocked if he got drafted in the thir- first round. Like I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't necessarily predict it, but I would not be shocked is Roger Rosengarten out of Washington, hmm. the right tackle. I think that he is very underrated because the last time we saw Roger Rosengarten was against Michigan, where he had a couple very bad plays in that game, you know, gave up a couple of key pressures in that contest that allowed Michigan to kind of, you know, derail the Washington offense that had been high power for most of the season. So our last impression of Roger was not great, but if you had watched his film the past two years in its entirety, it was very good. It was very good film. He reminds me a lot of Mitchell Schwartz that used to play and was a stalwart right tackle for a long time and for several years before he you know got hurt and then his career was kind of cut short a little bit but i think that this young man has enough athleticism to potentially play left tackle if you need him to but if not i think he's at least a plus starting right tackle in the nfl and a guy that if he's a late first round pick wouldn't be shocked but i don't think he gets out of the top 64 like i think he's a slam dunk second rounder if not a late first round guy nice nice so I don't know if you're like Mel Caper and make your draft book every year, whatever you do. But let's go to that last page. Let's go deep down. But the last pick is like 232 or something. Yeah. I'm way down there. Late round seven. Maybe most people are just uh, too drunk to pay attention to the draft at that point. I don't know. But maybe somebody the Vikings could take way late in this thing who could be, you know, be a potential steal. Yeah, I was toying with a couple of mock draft simulators to find my my exact answer yeah. for this one because I just want to see how the board might fall potentially in a couple of different simulations. So two guys that I landed on that I – think bring a lot of value later in the draft. So one is a linebacker, Tyron Hopper, who is out of Missouri. He was a Florida transfer. He is he is a incredibly athletic run and chase linebacker, more of a will on the next level, kind of lightly built, but I think he brings tremendous value for his coverage ability, his ability to, with closing speed to work in pursuit, and I think that he could also play special teams for you. So his 
his processing is still a, a work in progress and his power profile is still a work in progress, which obviously I can improve, improve a power profile. I mean, that's an off season in an NFL strength and conditioning program and he'll get, he'll be fine in that department, but he's still got, it's a little lighter built needs to add power needs to process a little better, but he can run and he can hit. And those guys, I think find a spot on the next level later in the draft. Like I think I would be surprised if Tyron Hopper's not on a, not on a roster for a couple of years, at least as a special teams ace and backup will linebacker. Like I think that he possesses that upside. And the last guy is, I feel like everyone has fallen in love with Mason McCormick, the South Dakota state guard this year. Like everyone mm-hmm. is for what he did at the East West shrine. And then what he did obviously at the combine with his testing and everything, like people have fallen in love with that guy. But I think that he's kind of overshadowed their offensive tackle out of South Dakota state, Garrett Greenfield, who is right around six foot six, Right, I think as you measure, measured in like 330 pounds to the combine, his weight was a little bit up. Despite that, had the highest vertical leap that we have ever seen of an offensive lineman, 38 and a half inches. He also had a uh, 9'3 broad jump. So this is a very explosive player, really smooth on film, liked his 2021 film a lot, hated his 2022 film, to be honest, but 2023 was a lot more 2021 than it was 2022. So I thought he really had a nice rebounded season. He is a guy that I just think that, He's going to find a roster later in the draft. Like he's going to be a guy that he's going to be a swing player, be able to play right tackle. Obviously has the athleticism to play left tackle. He might be a little power deficient and might never be a full-time starter on the next level. But as a guy that can potentially be a swing player and get you out of a football game or spot start occasionally, I think Garrett Greenfield out of South Dakota State brings a lot of value. Hell yes. Listen, I I love listening to you just go off, man. It's fun (laughs) to hear that brain work and spit out some prospects. Uh, One last question for you. I got to ask you this. This is just for me watching you uh, with Joe a lot. So, you know, I'm sitting here. I'll have my little cup of water I'm sipping on. Uh, Some shows you pull out this big ass like jug of. Oh, yeah. It's it's like a fucking half gallon. What is what? I I don't have it with me. What's I was actually doing there? it on a show yesterday, man. So I, I, I live here in Jersey and we are kind of obsessed with Wawa around here. Right. So like, I'm a big iced tea guy. So yeah. Wawa diet lemon tea is kind of my thing. Oh, so like, like I'll, an Arnie Palmer. Yeah. Ba- yeah. Basically yeah. like an Arnold Palmer. So I'll, I'll, I'll literally get it and I will throw it in the freezer for like two hours. I'll get okay. it super icy and then I'll just down that thing over the next couple hours, man. Like that's my <laughs> thing. So yeah, but the big, uh, Big iced tea guy over here, so that's, that's that's my drink of choice. That's what I thought it was. I didn't know. Maybe it was Long Island iced tea. I didn't know what the hell was going on so, there. But it's, so, it's, some people on other shows ask me if it's milk, and I'm like, nope. I can guarantee it's not milk. It's 100 not milk. It's brown. <laughs> it ain't milk. You can tell it's yeah, not exactly. milk. Well, someone said chocolate milk or something. I'm oh, like, okay. no, I I, okay. I don't want to poop all day. So like, I'm not just gonna yeah. be down in chocolate milk all day. It's not <laughs> not my thing. So, <laughs> all right, Ryan, we appreciate you coming on, man. I can talk to you all day. This has been fantastic. Really, really enjoyed it. Again, guys, give him a follow at Rise and Draft on twitter you will not regret it again ryan thanks for your time man we appreciate it absolutely brother thank you for having me all right guys that wraps this one up remember as you're uh, going over twitter and uh following ryan at rising draft remember this guys keep your skull in your hole